over the past couple of months, he has been featured in both national and international media and conferences to explore the role of Africans in building and shaping Africa, including the African Decent Society uh, Festival in Canada. Hakima series with Ellen Johnson Salif organized by the UNDP, the NBA Academy in Salif, Senegal, all African Conference of Churches, AACC, CRIP in Dakar, Senegal, African Business Forum to mention but a few of the international conferences that he has featured in. Usman graduated from the University of the Gambia with a bachelor's degree in development studies in 2019. He later earned certifications in sustainable development goals, global health, and of recent, a postgraduate training certificate in leadership innovation. This young man, Usman Toure, I welcome you to the podium to give your foundation day lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning to you all. I am indeed delighted to be here with you today. Uh, special greetings to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Labode, the Chancellor, University of uh, Ocean State University, Deputy Vice Chancellors here present, government representatives, members of staffs, Ocean State University students and all protocols respectfully observe. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here today to share with you the African value systems and what the youths can do in redeeming the trend. First, I would like to give this as a preamble. Before the 15th century, Africans are said to have worked literally naked, men with only lynch cloth, and women with a dark piece rubbed around their waist and breast. From that we could infer that the European historians have found more than enough reasons to regard Africa as a continent of savage, naked tribes that have not found the moral incentives to cover their bodies. Hence, labeled us uncivilized. Beside the joke, the purpose of this preamble is not necessarily to go over one of the most clinch mockeries of African civilization or construct argument that question the link between civilization and the insufficient covering of the African body before the 15th century but rather an attempt to think of it in a different way. The historians must have had their own intellectual freedom to caution and conduct questions about human behavior, but maybe they asked the wrong questions. Questions that would hardly explain much about our values, they asked, but harbored and preconceived their responses, their gender relations, and did not find the relationship between Africans and their behavior. I believe that being uncomfortable about certain responses and behaviors in other human beings, other than oneself, is only natural, but I will argue that questioning why they behave the way instead of categorizing them to classes is a rigid biases of historical sentiments is unjustifiable. Therefore, reasons as to why girls were brought up to aspire for marriage and boys to hunt become sole providers of families, why they worship deities in a form of natural endowments like the rivers and mountains all form a much better and logical understanding of the African civilization. Africans value systems in the pre-colonial era. Before the continent opened up to the outsiders, starting with the Arabs and later developed to become 
what was the transatlantic slave trade of before even the transatlantic slave trade there came the trans-saharan trade which was a trade between the western part of the continent and the northern part of the continent who were already in contact with the arab nations basically what we see is africans have always been generous individuals that open up to strangers first we open to the arabs and second we open to the europeans by doing so we give opportunities to individuals who came into the continent and give them the space to leave and exhibit their intention in dealing with the people of the African society. What we really came to realize is that in this very time, the African society, which was already built with values, it was built by communal efforts where individuals come together with their collective responsibility, first organize themselves politically by either centralized or dispersed groups of individuals, in which in the centralized aspect, individuals come with concerts to gather and identify individuals to serve as their leaders. And these individuals were also assessed by their generosity, their dedication, and their love and patriotism towards the communities that they were leading. Again, spiritually, around the same time, we understood that African societies have always been very spiritual and worship their duties in link to natural endowments. And as a result of this, people were connected to a divine rule and these very leaders were not only individuals who lead their societies politically, but serve as a link between them and that of their gods and ancestors. It can be understood that in so many instances, this group of individuals who were leading will receive instructions through the oracles from the ancestors or from God, and therefore these instructions were brought and put into practice. In some instances, as long as this was a practice, there has been moments where the leader, through their selfish interest, of course, will queue to the oracles to demand for certain things to be bestowed upon them and to their fellows. And then we all understood that some of which could have been fabricated just to make sure that they can impose authority on the people that they were leading. One of the examples that we can infer is the King Jack Telengale of East Africa with the famous prophecies of the giant snake, which is the blockbuster episode of East African history. But again, we have also seen a structure of politics like the Hotla system in Botswana which was formed not only as a political institute, but a policy formulation ground where young people, all individuals, will gather and meet to discuss the relevant things on moving their societies forward. Someone may ask, again, how did we come to lose all this? The answer is very simple. When we open up again to the outsiders, we let everything with them. African societies for far too long are made to believe that Africa with all what it started with from the ancient civilization to what we current have, in order for us to do things right, we must think beyond the continent. That solutions are not found on the ground of Africa. That right things are not done in Africa but we have to rely on individuals outside of the continent for either instructions or directions in moving forward. This very lecture, that is what I intend to bring to you and to remind my fellow individuals, youths across the continent, that there is the need for the Africans to look down and dig into the solutions that Africa was built before colonialism. I just want to say that Africa, whenever we're talking about our history, in most cases we limit it to slavery, we limit it to 
colonialism. We have to understand that Africa existed before all these things. Africa is the root of civilization. Science, technology, the advancement of knowledge, philosophy, mathematics is a product of the second dynasty and the third dynasty in Egypt. And this was 2,000 years before the coming of Christ. Therefore, Africa experienced civilization when the rest of the world was in caves. When we look at the pre-colonial African society, it starts with the individual name that was given to a child. The names were deeply thought of in secret. Old individuals will gather and analyze the date of the birth of a child and then develop a name link to your responsibility and as well as your spiritual connections. These was observed and therefore individuals were given value just with the name that was given to them. But this doesn't stop there. As you develop, there were initiation ceremonies organized where a child is mentored, where a child is taught to acquire skills and livelihood skills for that matter. Elders in the communities were taxed with these responsibilities and individuals specializing in different areas. Melting of irons, the use of gold, carving, weaving for clothes were old skills taught within African societies. And for especially the boys, when it comes to hunting, life skills, using bow and arrows, serving as patriotic individuals that will stand to defend their territory whenever the need arises. This has been going on, and education was linked to action. Education was linked to purpose and was accompanied with a self of patriotism and a knowledge of the individual who you are, but the responsibility that you owe to your society. Culturally, we also came to realize that young individuals at the time were key factors in moving societies forward. Initiation ceremonies were organized, but in these initiation activities, individuals were tasked in groups, but they share certain similarities. I am quite sure that as it is done in the Mandinka community in the Gambia, be it the Wolof, the Jolas, likewise we have in Nigeria and many other parts of the continent, there has been similarities. An example was the age through which people are brought into these initiation ceremonies. It is quite evident that these were grounds through which men or young boys and girls were transformed to become responsible citizens and patriotic and stand a cause to the societies in they, they belong to. Again, we also came to realize that all this was evidence, but what we end up losing was our education system. And this is what resulted to the value systems that we have today. We are taught to less appreciate the African values. We are taught to less understand that the African is a fellow, a brother, and a sister, but we have embraced a system that makes us feel bad about who we are as if we are children of a lesser God. When we analyze the systems that we have today, starting from spirituality, it has been narrowed to religion, and religion promises us certain things. It promises us unity. It promises us love. Religion promises us kindness. It promises us trustworthy. It promises us health, and it promises us heaven. But are this a living reality of the religions that we belong to today? Are we united as a continent? Are we trustworthy as individuals? Are we patriotic as Africans? And are we ready to build solution for the continent? If this is the promise of religion, are they a living reality across the continent? Again, when it comes to politics, 
individuals were loyal to the gods and the ancestors and the people who serve as link in between them and their ancestrals. But today, our politics have been narrowed to few ideologies. And these ideologies are what became communism, socialist states, or capitalist state, or what is mostly used democratic states across the continent. But one thing that is certain, we have been confused in embracing these ideologies because they do not hold to the fundamental reality of the African society. One of the biggest things that affects us as a nation, us as a continent today, is belonging and dividing ourselves based on our ideologies or ideological alignment with individuals whose sole objective was designing Africa in a way that they can be extract in nature. That it can never be developmental, but to extract raw materials, including the human resources from the continent to the outside world. It is today a living testimony that Africans have contributed greatly in developing every other society outside of the continent, except our own. The individuals behind the US success in development for the past century has been black individuals. We are the workers in Europe, and we are today the workers in Asia, and we are the workers in the Arabian countries. But yet we found it difficult to build on the continent and to re make Africa register the development that it deserves. Again, when it comes to globalization, someone may ask, oh, we live in a global village. Africa is not an island. We need outsiders, well and good. We need partners, we don't need exploiters. That is what I have to tell you today. One of the most misused terms in exploiting the continent today have been globalization. That Africa needs outsiders. And by globalization, I mean globalization in ideas, globalization in culture, and globalization in trade. Tell me in what way does Africa benefit in these three things? The globalization of ideas. But yet we are made to think one way. And what I see with globalization is globalization of Western ideas and Western values with Africa lacking behind. We have been made to less appreciate the thinking and thoughts that have been locally initiated to think that Africans cannot have the right mind to think for themselves. Again, when it comes to globalization of culture, what is there in the African continent in our culture that is highly appreciated and embraced by the rest of the world and they are teaching their children today about the continent of Africa? It's of course no. What we see is a fact that cultural globalization is going in one way, where Africa is in the receiving ground. We receive all form of cultures and making us less appreciative of our own culture. Today, young people within the continent will hold and reference the Kim Kardashians, the Nollywood stars, paying less regard to their own community leaders. And the trends of the globe today is set by these very individuals. Are we then patriotic and are we ready to be the solution for the continent? This is a question that we must answer if we want to move ahead and if we really want to solve problems in the continent and not, no longer be the peddlers of problem but the merchants of solution as in Professor Jibril Fall's word. Again, one of the things that the continent have been exposed to is the fact that with these governance system, with the trading systems imposed as a result of globalization, I believe our elders sitting here can tell us about the structural adjustment plan introduced by the IMF and the World Bank. It has been one of the greatest or the biggest instrument used by the outsiders to make Africa as a continent less developed 
poor continent less appreciative of thinking and policies and as well as grassroots initiatives. The structural adjustment plan have impoverished all African countries in the sub-Saharan region by making them prioritize their spending on things that are beneficial to the Western markets and to the Western politicians. Again, not only that, but today we feel happy to be with brands that are Western and of Western values than our own. And this is as a result of the trade that we have ventured in. One thing also that is certain, the misunderstanding of the ideologies that we embrace, the misunderstanding of the religions that we belong to today, the rejection of our own traditional spirituality have resulted in a disunity along the continent and in this, young people are affected the most. As we are sitting here discussing about the future of the continent as young individuals, there are a group of young Africans in some way looking at another African as a threat. And if they have the chance to take their life, they will do so. And these are the same individuals that we need if we want to move ahead by transforming their minds and thinking into solutions and understanding that Africa as a continent needs to prosper as any other continent in the world. Again, we have to understand that as young people, sometimes we are trapped with the notion that we are young, so therefore we cannot act now, we have to wait. The question is, what and who are we waiting for? We have to think good in ourselves. We have to start appreciating Africa as a continent. We have to start thinking solution and meeting in occasions like this to have a dialogue, intergenerational dialogue, dialogues across the continent as young people in developing solutions that holds the fact that Africa is not a threat to herself, but we are a force that needs to work together to register the development that our continent desires. Today, in so many instances, we've seen global partners, big companies coming down to the continent, exploring our own resources, using our own individuals as agents and as instrument to dominate our societies. And this is a living proof. Torado and Smith in development economics make mention of the comparado groups, that the white man don't have to travel the interior of Africa to extract resources any longer. They just need a young African program to do that work on their behalf. We have to understand that we are graduating engineers, we are graduating lawyers, we are graduating doctors, we are graduating individuals who should serve the interests and purpose of their communities. But today, a huge chunk of that graduates are the people that we're seeing sinking in the Mediterranean Sea. These are the same young women that we see in Arab countries being exploited and taken as modern day slaves. These are the same individuals that the continent needs to harvest their talents and potentials in making sure that we can register the development that we desire as a continent. But again, saying all this as a problem in the continent, are there no solutions? Someone may ask. The young people are the agents of change. And they are the individuals that our ancestors and our old systems have tapped in in order to make sure that they have registered success in their own development. They are apt, prolific, they are with disruptive mindset and thinking. The same young people are individuals that have the potentials to drive change and to drive growth among the continent. They are the innovators, they are the leaders, they are the workers, so therefore young people are the future. But that future starts now. Few weeks ago, 
I was reading an article by a famous scholar by the name Jeffrey Sachs, and I was made to understand that he was the foundation, he was the graduation lecturer last year. In this very document, Blood in the Sand, he used to highlight the US intervention, military intervention in the developing countries, that it has come to root and it has exposed its weakness and not potentials by the US government. But what we need to identify and draw lessons in this, and he highlighted was, our investments must be diversified into things that are meaningful. Investment in education, and I mean real education, with potentials, with skills, and provide a ground for African youths to exhibit their talents within the continent. Again, investment in the health sector. Our mothers, our sisters, our young brothers need help and need attention. And they need us. So we therefore have to channel our skills in these very societies in making sure that we can give them the development and the need that they have. However, when we look at the continent, to some, it may seem impossible to fix it. It is not yet impossible. We, the youths, have to take responsibilities. And to do that, we must start questioning. We must start questioning as young people, questioning the political system, questioning the education system, questioning our social livelihood, and being part of the solution. The world where these things have happened, things have also been questioned, so we must question. The violence against black people is a manifestation everywhere, in Europe, in the Americas, and in the continent. The fact that the black man becomes black only when they are in contact with the white man is sometimes bearable, but really painful. And the white man becoming white only when they are in Africa is painful, but then it comes with all the accorded privileges that we give them. I know because I've been traveling across the continent, and I see privileges where individuals deliberately ignore brothers and sisters as a result of their color and appreciate individuals just by their appearance. And this we must look into. We must start to appreciate ourselves. We must start to build respect, love, and unity among ourselves. But again, we have to be ready to unite ourselves to make sure that as young people, this is not just for us to come and take selfish gain or selfish interest, but a cause that we must stand to liberate the continent because we are the hope. And if we don't get it right this time, Africa can never make it. Before, it was colonialist, economic systems. Now we have technology just on the side. We must be skillful, we must develop potentials, but we must be patriotic enough to save the trajectory for the African continent. And to do this, we must forget about our selfish gain. It is a course out there that we must undertake. We must liberate this generation of Africa and generations of Africans to come. They don't deserve what we have experienced. And to save that, to build that, we must be the agents of change. And we have to be ready. And I will therefore want to put this question to all of us here today, that if we leave this particular hall, we are going as ambassadors. We are here as ambassadors of our own homes. We are here as ambassadors of our own institutions. And we are here as ambassadors of our own villages, our own towns, our own cities. We have to be ambassadors of Nigeria. We have to be ambassadors of Africa because we are the eyes and ears of the continent. And whoever sees us should see Africa. Whoever sees us should see unity and should see dignity across the board. This is a message that I want all of us 
to think and also to make actions towards. Again, one thing that I would also like to appeal is for us to understand that Africans have sacrificed a lot. Africa had leaders that have outsigned any of any other people in the world. We can take examples of leaders in the continent that have stand for the interests of their people. If we want to move ahead as young people, we must look into these great individuals and take them as references. We are tired of talking about the problems. Let us see examples among African leaders and build on that for the future of the continent. We cannot all be politicians, but we can all impact positive change in our communities. And that is an individual responsibility that every African can undertake. Most, <laughs> most of us remember the great Pan-Africanist like Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was not in Africa. He was fighting for Africa in Europe and in America, but fighting for African descent to be able to come back and reunite with their people. His main mission was self-upliftment and self-reliance. We must be able to uplift ourselves financially, but we must be able to uplift ourselves with dignity, with respect, with values that Africa is Africa, and Africans are the individuals who live within it, and Africans are the solution to their own problems. Another thing that is very certain before I take a leave of you is the fact that today when we look across the board in the continent, we see a lot of issues happening with young people. And if we really want to be the solution to the continent, we must rethink about ourselves. We must be ready to take up challenges, and we must be ready to learn lessons. It doesn't matter where you were born, as long as you were born within the continent or hold an African blood. Patriotism, dedication to work, is a living reality and a living testimony of the African tradition. Individuals who live within this continent were great people who stood and fight for their people. And that is what we need to embrace today as young people. We have to take the course. We must not narrow our academic lenses to the curriculums. We have to read wider than that. We have to investigate. We have to make research. We have to find grounds to learn about our culture. It was the great Nigerian scholar, Chinua Achebe, who said, history will always glorify the hunter unless and until the lions have their own historians. And if we really want to move ahead as a continent, we must be ready to take up the challenge in rewriting our history. Africa is categorized as an underdeveloped continent. We are categorized as an uncivilized continent. But one thing that remains certain is every other society in the world depend heavily in Africa in order to survive. As I walk around the streets, as we drove around Nigeria, all I see is great potentials. These are the same potentials that outsiders are trying to tap away from us. And to do that, they just have to make us less appreciative on who we are and what we can do about our own. From today, let us channel our skills into using the resources in the continent into something beneficial to our societies and to something beneficial to our people. That is what the African values teaches. Individuals were not just responsible to their individual interests or make decent living for themselves. But your success in the continent is measured based on your impact on your community. This is what our ancestors taught us. And this is the lessons that, must, that we must relearn as Africans. Before we leave this place, I want to say one thing. 
There is a society out there waiting for us because they are disunited. They're having an issue solving a particular dispute. There is another society out there waiting for us because there is poverty. Individuals are finding it difficult to have three meals a day and even two meals a day. There is a society out there waiting for us because respect and dignity, morals and values are no longer in their area. This is the same society that waits for our answer. We have not been sent in schools for no reason. We are sent to learn, we are sent to appreciate, and we are sent to school to learn and go back and impact. We must be the solution. Africa must be liberated, and young people must take up the challenge, because we are the solution. On that note, I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. If you, if you enjoyed the lecture, can we please appreciate Usman Ture once again? Thank you very much. Please let us have our seat. There are a series of questions that we need to answer within ourselves. Are you a good ambassador of Nigeria? I would like to quickly recognize a representative of the Atauja of Oshogo, Obajimo Abidemi Laraoye II, uh, who has been represented here by the Ajaguma of Oshogo Chief Gabriel Ojo. Thank you very much. Please let us appreciate him. You're highly welcome, sir. Also, we have the Chief Odofi of Oshogo Land, Chief Okpatunde Isiaka. You're highly welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, online, we have a series of people joining us online. We have Akintunde Lawa, Soli, Okpoyemi, Sakaria. We really appreciate, uh, we appreciate you. Thank you very much for joining. On this note, I would like to quickly invite uh, the Pro Chancellor and Chairman of Govin Council to be assisted with the Vice Chancellor. We want, uh, we want the Pro Chancellor to help us to present a token that we have to the guest lecturer. We want the Vice Chancellor to assist the Pro Chancellor. Um, uh, Osman Ture, this is just a token of our appreciation for the efforts we've made and the very brilliant discourse that um, and um, give a lot of hope to our continent and to our younger people. Uh, take this as a token. I uh, hope that uh, we'll find a way that you get this to the Gambia in one piece, I pray. Um, as well, the, the things that these are very easy, easy to carry. Um, you have our notepads and a few things there. Uh, being memorabilia from the university, uh, we hope that um, you'll we'll be back here some other time in the near future. Thank you very much, sir. Also, I want the Pro Chancellor to still continue because I want him to, to do the closing remarks. I would like to quickly invite the Chairman of our Governing Council and the Pro Chancellor, Malam Yusuf Ali, for his closing remarks. Please let us appreciate him.
the vice chancellor and other principal officers of the university. The immediate past, uh, you have this confusion. Is this former or ex? Uh, yesterday, when I saw Lamri, uh, the former vice chancellor of uh, Lasso, he said it's uh, immediate past, vice chancellor. And I said, that when somebody now comes after the new one, what do you become? Nice. So, <laughs> uh, Professor Alan Rwaju Hagbun, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, former Vice Chancellor, Lagos State University. Very eminent Nigerians who are here, members of management staff and students of our great university and our guests. Big good morning to all of us. When I came yesterday, the Vice Chancellor brought, I can say, young man. Um, brought him to me in the hotel. I wasn't looking forward to such a young person, actually. But I was very, very happy. Yesterday at a religious event, I made a point. I said our elders have a saying that any type of cult to which young people are not invited, it will die. When you have any particular system anywhere and young people are excluded, it will, it's a generational problem. It will die with your generation and end of time. I think with people like Usman, this continent has hope. And I'm happy that you have proved my theory right. Whenever I travel to anywhere in the world and I see Nigerians, many of them, they are totally overused. Because you see a 45-year-old man looking like my grandfather. I said, look, what are you doing here? And you know, it's difficult at home. I said, it's more difficult where you are when you have to do three jobs in a day. Just for you to survive. And, and I'm saying this with all respect. 90% of Nigerians who live in the UK, especially London, they live in semi-squalor. I can say this. So, and I've told people before, I said, look, you have a master's. You are driving cab, yeah. Don't you think if you drive the same cab in Nigeria, you make better money? And that is why as a matter of policy, when I enter any public bathroom, toilet, I give money to those who keep the toilet there. Because more educated Nigerians are outside there washing toilets. So, Usman, I want to thank you for making true my theory that we don't need to leave this continent before we attain our potentials. We don't need to. Oh, there is insecurity. There is also insecurity outside of this country, you know. Statistically, New York is the most dangerous city in the world. New York City. And it has the highest per capita presence of policemen than any other city in the world. In New York, you see NYP, NYPD, the New York Police Department. You can move from here to that door before you meet at least four vehicles of police in New York. And it is said that every six minutes, somebody is killed in New York. A murder is committed. And every two minutes, a rape is committed. And anybody who has ever gone to Joburg before Johannesburg, Johannesburg is more than 50 times more dangerous than Lagos. In fact, you are advising Joburg that when it is 7 p.m., never walk alone or walk in the street corners. And one member of your council shared this experience with me. That when I did my last trip, I, I, you know, we never got talking about uh, Professor Bedo Alao. He said they were, we were talking about Joe Bog and the dangers, and, and he said, look, Egbon, you don't even need to waste your time. It's not even night. 
that I was robbed during daylight, 2, 2 p.m., that I just left my hotel, came out onto the streets, and the young man just came and pulled a gun. Oh, yes, in Johannesburg. And said, oh, bring your purse. I said, look, I'm not carrying purse. Bring the money. I said, I have no money. And then they got talking. And he said, look, young man, can you please put away the gun first so we can discuss? So the man put the gun in his pocket. And then they started talking. Eventually, he said he told him to follow him to his hotel. He left him in the lobby. Went up, went up and brought some, uh, maybe 200 rand, and gave to him. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, whatever challenges you think we are facing here, is because we have not traveled sufficiently. All human beings are the same all over the world. We all have our criminal tendencies. But it's the law and enforcement of laws that make the difference between our continent and other places. I appeal to our students, our graduates, don't run away. You can attain your potentials in this country. And I'm appealing to parents who want to send their children out. I tell people, and I'm going to say it here again for the often time, when you are growing older and your children are outside there, you are childless. Don't waste your time. I'm telling you, you are childless because the time you need them most when you are vulnerable is that you won't see them. You know, as you are growing older, you are becoming more vulnerable. And for those of you that are men, I pity you. That is the time that your children will take your wives and take them away. And you die here like a pauper. Like a pauper. I was telling my brother this morning when we were walking, and I said, there, was a, there is a friend of ours, a friend of my friend. The father died, and they were having the funeral. They came from the U.S., and I told my friend I won't go because I, I will quarrel with them. These wicked children, they, they went to America. At the point, brought, took their mother away, and their father, who was a lawyer, died like a, like, like a, like, like a chicken. So please, I beg of you, with all this your wahala, do you encourage your children to go and sit down there? You are better without having children. And to back from, once your children are there permanently, it is summer. That's the truth. Because when you are vulnerable, when you need them, is then they will be doing video call to you and you'll be useless. Very, very useless. So. Those of you that are still, that have parents, like I do have a mother. My mother is about 89, going to 90. Your presence, seeing you alone, puts a lot of lives in their lives. No, don't, any amount you have, you can send any money, it's useless. Your presence. And the, the, way, the same way you feel now, when your children, you see your children, your adrenaline goes up, you are happy. It's the way your parents also feel. And then imagine yourself. So, Usman, God continue to bless you and look after you. Not only are you a good ambassador of our continent, you have, uh, I was watching you when you are making your presentation, you are not reading the lecture, you are speaking to the paper. <laughs> what you have done is what some of our intellectuals find difficult to do. Some will be reading the paper as if their lives as if they were not the authors. So you are a good encouragement to everybody on this continent. I also feel encouraged. I feel hopeful that all hope is not lost. Finally, and you made the point very clearly. Our forebears were forced into slavery to develop the West. We are voluntarily working to slavery now to continue the development. The question I ask you is, it's difficult here, it's difficult here. Who will make it easy here when all of us will run away? This is the lesson for all of us, and this is the point for all of us. You could see a young man who had very humble background like most of us, but he's making good for himself by employing his brains. God bless you.
Thank you very much, sir. On this note, I would like to invite the investor registrar, Mr. Gafara Debayashitu, for the vote of thanks. I have to appreciate Almighty God for what he has done in the life of uh, this university. The user was licensed in 2006. We commenced full operation in 2007. That is why we are now having the 14th Foundation Day Lecture that has just been delivered by Usman Ture. 14 years, there have been hills, there have been hops, there have been down. But we thank God for what they have done in the life of the university and that of the area. I also want to thank the governor of the state, who is a visitor to the university, Mr. Adeboyega Oyetola. He's a real visitor because he's a given us that academic freedom. Like I said the other day, he has not been disturbing us. We thank him for that. And he's doing what he's supposed to do. <laughs> now, especially to the Poo Chancellor. Poo Chancellor is a special breed indeed. Since yesterday, he has relocated to Shugo on his own expense. <laughs> Seeing he has appointed on the 8th of August 2016, he has not taken a cover from the post of university for himself. And he has contributed more than any other person in this system. I want to say that. Because the peace we are enjoying today is actually attributed to the Pro Chancellor. I want to say that in this university. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Then to our team leader. That's uh, Professor Labo de Popola. I say team leader because he believes that he has to discuss with everybody because we can have the best option. So, where I want to say, this is the last foundation lecture that the PC witnessed at the PC, but when he comes, he will still come in a better form to this university. <laughs> we thank God in your life for what God has used you to do in this university. It is landmark indeed. Yes, tomorrow is your special day, Professor Lani Blackburn, when you are going to deliver the convocation lecture. We thank you for coming, and uh, by tomorrow, we know that we will enjoy you. Thanks so much indeed. <laughs> to all the principal officers, the DVC Arif, DVC A&D, the Bosa, the Liberian, and all others who are members of management, I want to say a big thank you for the cooperation we are enjoying. And to the students in particular and the staff, we thank you for what we are actually doing here because everybody is doing well. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Registrar. Uh, please, I would like to quickly make this announcement that the program still continues. We're going to be having uh, the convocation of the colleges of uh, humanities and culture, science, engineering, and technology just the same time. So the people on the high table and all the people that are going to join the procession will leave the auditorium now. Then the rest will remain seated. So by 10.30, the procession will be entering, and uh, we are going to follow the rest of the rules and regulations. Thank you very much. So the people on the high table will leave now. Please, everybody should still settle down. 
So the convocation will start by exactly 11 o'clock. So the procession will start by 10.40. So that at least for those who are to join us online, we are starting 11 a.m. Thank you.